assalamu alaikum students so today uh, we will do uh, we will start in the chronology and the first clinical case that we will cover is hypothyroidism uh, or graves disease okay uh, don't worry about this diagram it will be explained later on inshallah in the lecture uh, so uh, requisite knowledge uh, before we start this uh, this particular lecture is this bit this bit needs to be done on your own okay uh, how are thyroid hormones produced their regulation and their target organs however uh, uh, by virtue of the way this case is laid down uh, some of this uh, will be covered anyway uh, well if not all of it some of it will definitely be covered okay um, right coming to what will be covered formally uh, and rather comprehensively is uh, the the whole case of uh, what hypothyroidism is what does it do how is it diagnosed etc etc uh, specifically these the th these three points uh, maybe would be new for uh, students who just stick to guidance uh, so th this will be uh, hopefully something new for them uh, role of uh, thyroid binding globulin uh, how does the fluctuation in tbg leads to all sorts of uh, changes in the way thyroid hormones actually uh, work uh, then there is this these two tests one is radioactive iodine uptake test the other is t3 resin uptake test okay so these will be covered and these need to be studied before uh, we launch into this uh, scenario inshallah okay so this is the scenario ruj usman is the subject uh, she is a 22 year old medical student uh who is very conscious of her weight she she's into a lot of diets and stuff uh over the last 3 months however she has uh lost weight 20 pounds about 20 pounds uh despite having a very high appetite so she she feels hungry a lot uh she eats a lot uh, still uh, she is losing weight and this is the amount of weight that she's lost over the past 3 years uh, the past 3 uh, months um her other complaints are nervousness sleeplessness heart palpitations and her period is irregular uh, she notes that she always feels hot and would prefer the ac on on most of the times okay so this is the history that she gives on the physical examination ruj is found to be restless fidgety uh, there is a tremor in her hands uh, at 5 foot 7 she she only weighs 110 pounds which is underweight Her BP is up, as is evident, and so is the heart rate. Okay. Um, she has a wide-eyed stare. This is not a rouge, by the way. This is some random uh, pics from the internet. Um, and her neck appears full. Seems to have a swelling in her neck. Um, again, this is not an actual picture. This is just from the net. Uh, this is a very clear uh, swelling of the neck, profound. But rouge is maybe is a bit on the lower side. so how did she pick up that she has a neck lump uh, well uh, when she uh, looked at her photographs taken a year earlier earlier ago uh, she didn't have any such swelling and when she takes a photograph now she clearly compares and sees that there is a difference in the uh, neck architecture diagnosis well she went to the doctor he obviously uh, took the history examined her and his uh, diagnosis is thyroid toxicosis now well while this is a pretty decent uh, the, the diagnosis uh, the point is why why is a healthy uh, young woman's thyroid acting up okay so labs were sent these are the lab results uh, uh, total t4 is increased free t4 is increased tsh is decreased okay so this is uh, uh, interesting this is uh, basically the Uh, the case scenario that you need to be now pondering over okay so here are the questions regarding the scenario the first is uh, regarding the symptoms so a physician who suspected thyroid toxicosis looking at her symptoms why is which why is each of the following symptoms consistent with increase in thyroid hormones so these were the symptoms if you remember right one was weight loss the other one was heat intolerance remember she used to feel hot all the time increased palpitations increased pulse rate and increased blood pressure we 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 covered this 
while taking her history and physically examining her okay so this is question number one now the format is you take time out you pause this video and you think about it okay when you've thought about it scribble a few points uh, hopefully inshallah you you get all of it right but then and at the end i will show you the key so assuming that you have paused the video thought about it now we'll discuss the key right so thyrotoxicosis hyperthyroidism that is is a pathophysiological state and basically it features high levels of free thyroid hormones now going one by one through her uh, uh, symptomatology and the basis of it number one was increased weight loss right why did she feel why did she experience weight loss well because thyroid hormones are known to increase bmr the basic metabolic rate the oxygen consumption and hence the nutrient consumption so uh, you can say that she is uh, basically in a hyper metabolic state okay uh, that also uh, the high appetite that she was experiencing also is a is a hint is a clue to what's going on inside so despite of having a lot of food in she would lose weight uh, because of high thyroid hormones raising the bmr okay number two question was heat intolerance heat intolerance is linked uh, with this point increased oxygen consumption basically results in increased heat production and the normal cooling mechanisms of the body are insufficient to cool the body uh, and hence she would always feel hot and would prefer a room with a ac or or a cool ventilation uh, third question was increased heart rate now this is interesting question number three and four are linked and it's 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 interesting because it links to one point that the thyroid hormones basically do they induce synthesis of a number of proteins including in those proteins is beta 1 receptors in the heart now if you remember your cardiovascular system from first years you would remember that beta 1 receptors are present in sa node and in ventricular muscle right so if you increase the number of beta 1 receptors in the heart in both of these areas which thyroid hormones basically do they induce the synthesis of these proteins uh, uh, the stage is set beta receptors are now available thyroid hormones come and induce or connect with them and do what these receptors are designed to do so at the sa node they are designed to increase the heart rate so naturally when the thyroid hormones go will go up they will increase the heart rate okay uh, and in the ventricles basically the, uh, the the beta 1 receptors are are linked with contractility uh, increased contractility increased contract or simple contractility basically links with stroke volume if you increase the contractility the stroke volume would go up right and if the stroke volume goes up if you remember again your cardiovascular stroke volume is the main determinant of pulse pressure okay so both heart rate and pulse pressure would go up in hyperthyroidism okay uh, the last point is also related to cardiovascular uh, if you remember the formula for uh, blood pressure arterial blood pressure it is basically cardiac output into total peripheral resistance now total peripheral resistance here is is not changed however the cardiac output is okay how is the cardiac output increased in hyperthyroidism if you remember the formula for cardiac output it is basically stroke volume into heart rate stroke volume into heart rate is cardiac output yes so you have increased cardiac output both by increasing heart rate and by increasing stroke volume naturally it goes up two folds and increases the blood pressure of the patient as well this is question number one okay so this is question number two what is a physician thinking what does it need to think anyway well we know that it is thyrotoxicosis of some kind something is messing up the thyroid hormones which is it that's the main thing now he needs to work it out we need to work it out these are the four possible sources of high levels of thyroid uh, hormones in her blood okay and this is based on the hypothalamic anterior pituitary thyroid axis which is basically summarized nicely in this diagram so hypothalamus as you know releases uh, the uh, the trh okay which then stimulates the anterior pituitary uh, which then releases the tsh 
which then stimulates the thyroid. Thyroid produces T3 and T4, T4 in picture in this scenario, which has a negative feedback on the anterior pituitary. Uh, so if there is an increase in thyroid hormones, uh, this uh, naturally would inhibit the anterior pituitary to decrease uh, TSH production so that thyroid uh, is well regulated. So in this setup, uh, now what you are presented with is increased T4 and TSH being low. Okay, this, this is a peculiar situation, a uh, common one, of course. So theoretically speaking, <clears throat> the number one cause may be uh, a tumor sitting in hypothalamus, which is producing lots and lots of TRH. Then that TRH is overstimulating anterior pituitary uh, to release more TSH and that is causing thyroid uh, uh, hormone being more manufactured and more released in blood. Question number one, probability, maybe. Number two is the hypothalamus is fine, so is TRH. Uh, the problem lies in the anterior pituitary. Maybe there is a tumor in the anterior pituitary, okay, which is uh, releasing lots and lots of TSH, and then the rest of the pathway is the same. Okay. The third scenario is that TRH is fine, TSH is fine. The thyroid itself has gone berserk and it's produced, producing lots and lots of thyroid hormone. And this is called Graves' disease. Okay. Now I know that you know the diagnosis. That's not the point. The point is to take you through uh, uh, the, the clinical workup of such a patient. Okay. Obviously, patients will not come with a tag that they are suffering from Graves. So you'll be able to now see how it's diagnosed. Okay. That's the whole point of the scenario. And the fourth point is that if this person is taking some sort of medication or some sort of vitamins uh, which have uh, thyroid hormones uh, as a constituent, so exogenous thyroid hormones uh, leads to fictitious hyperthyroidism. So everything is fine. It's just that maybe because she's very uh, sensitive about her weight, uh, she's on a diet and this, that, the other, uh, so maybe some some somebody told her that this is one of the shortcuts of uh, losing weight and then she start started on these exogenous pills which has she doesn't know but it has thyroid hormones and it will increase her B bmr etc etc to decrease the weight uh, not healthy at all however these are the two uh, places where the thyroid hormone itself comes into uh, the picture these two are the ones which are higher up in the hierarchy. So these are the four possible diagnoses, okay? Which one is it most likely uh, causing Rouge's thyrotoxicosis? This is your question now. Uh, you have the lab findings and your knowledge of this regulatory pathway, you need to come up with the answer. Tick tock, take time out and think. Okay. Assuming that you've paused the video and you did a chin wag on the four questions, let's let's look at the key. Perugia's labs basically showed free T4 and total T4, okay, and decreased TSH. Now, total T4 includes free and protein-bound components in plasma, all right? So, basically, T4 was up while TSH was down. Now, let's take it from the top. The, the first cause that was coined was a TRH releasing tumor. A, it's rare, okay. B, if there was a TRH uh, uh, releasing tumor, uh, then it would have overly activated the anterior pituitary. Yes, as we mentioned before, and an overly activated anterior pituitary should have produced more TSH, not less TSH. So number one question, the number one probability is out it's not the probable cause. Number two uh, was uh, TSH, a TSH releasing tumor in, of the anterior pituitary. Again, in the bin, because you have TSH less than, than, uh, than normal. So number one and number two simply cannot be the possibility with looking at TSH uh, result uh, alone. So now, Basically, the dais is between the three and the fourth, i.e. either uh, thyroid line itself has become overactive, i.e. Graves' disease, she's maybe suffering from, or she has taken some sort of uh, supplement which uh, is raising her thyroid uh, hormones exogenously 
while the thyroid it's gland itself is, is uh, nothing to blame. Okay. This we cannot rule out based on this data. All right. Because in both of these cases, in Graves and in fictitious hyperthyroidism, T4 uh, will be raised, TSH will be snubbed. Okay. These two need to be sorted out. All right. All right. Question number three. So now the issue is we have two diagnoses. Uh, one is whether she has Graves' disease, and the other possibility is maybe she is on some sort of a supplement or a pill that has uh, thyroid uh, hormones or thyroid hormone-like uh, substances, um, uh, as mentioned in the previous explanation of question two. So now we have to rule one out so that we can pinpoint a diagnosis and move forwards with the management. So Ruj undergoes another test. This test is called radioactive iodine uptake test in which we give a known amount of uh, radioactive iodine to the person. Uh, and then uh, that is taken up, as you know, uh, uh, it's taken up by the thyroid cells, uh, but this time it's basically labeled with radioactivity. Uh, and at the, at, the, at the end of the test, uh, we use a gamma probe uh, to see how uh, this radioactive iodine has distributed itself uh, among the cells of the thyroid gland, which will show us uh, uh, whether it's taken up uh, uh, or not, if it has taken up, uh, whether it has been taken up by the gland itself totally, uniformly distributed or there are only particular areas which have taken up this uh, this substance and not the rest of it so when this was, test was performed on rouge uh, what basically the result was uh, it showed that it was uniformly uh, increased throughout the gland uh, I, will, I will show you the pic uh, in the key in short. so the whole gland basically lit up because it's obviously radioactive. Uh, so this, this bit here is very important. The uptake was uniformly distributed uh, throughout the gland. This means things. Um, how does this additional information refine our diagnosis? And how do we rule out uh, from the two? We need to rule out one on the basis of this. Uh, this you need to think about and then we'll discuss in the key. But before we go to that, just a bit of a revision on how the thyroid gland thyroid hormones are made with some additional information right here so basically thyroid cells they uh, we know that uh, there are two main things which are required for uh, formation of thyroid hormones one is iodine and the other is the amino acid tyrosine tyrosine is basically bound with uh, thyroglobulin which is found inside the cells and it sort of rotates between the cell and the follicular lumen in a, in, a, in a cyclic way. So the iodide form of iodine is picked up from the blood along with the sodium iodide symbotor. Okay. This is the first step, the, pick, the picking of iodide. Okay. This is the ionic form of iodine. When iodide is picked up, uh, it's, it comes in the cell. Uh, it is then taken through, uh, through the cell to the lumen. Okay. Uh, there is a change in iodide in that uh, there is oxidation of iodide to form iodine, okay? So iodine hits the follicular lumen. At the same time, tyrosine through uh, uh, thyroglobulin also enters the lumen from the cell. Now, uh, this peroxidase uh, enzyme is a very busy enzyme. Uh, it not only uh, 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 basically it covers this particular reaction from iodide into iodine, but it also uh, later on uh, catalyzes the organification of iodine, i.e. Uh, the combination of iodine with uh, thyroglobulin to form uh, the precursor forms of uh, the thyroid hormones, uh, monoamino uh, tyrosine and diido tyrosine. Okay, after this, you have a coupling reaction and finally, you basically form T4 and T3 along with remnants of MIT, MIT and DIT, which the, this whole complex is then taken up inside the cell, uh, retaken in, inside the cell, 
And finally, T4 and T3 are now available in the circulation and the rest is recycled. Okay, so this is very brief overview of uh, the whole uh, formation of thyroid hormones. Uh, you can have details from any standard textbook. Uh, what I wanted your attention basically to is this, is this, this bit here is from Genong. It's very nicely mentioned. So thyroid gland basically makes much more T4 than it makes T3. This is something to think about. So uh, this is in uh, uh, eco units, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, if I don't, if I remember correctly. So imagine th th this is it's 80 uh, uh, as compared to four uh, of T3. So clearly much more T4 is made than T3. Then there is an RT3, which is also made, but it's, it's, it's very minute. Okay. Now, uh, check this out. How, what does T4 do? So T4 basically also yields T3. So T4 goes uh, uh, into a change at the tissue level and uh, provides much of the T3, which actually is available for the tissue. Mind you that it's T3, which is biologically much more active than T4. Once again, T3 is that thing that we know uh, of the actions of thyroid hormones. Most of those thyroid actions are actually done by T3. However, thyroid gland does not directly make a lot of T3. It makes a lot of T4. T4 eventually then yields T3. Most of the T3, as you can see right here. So 27 units of uh, T3 actually come from T4. Only four units come from thyroid gland. So T4 basically uh, serves as a reservoir for T3 production and keeps T3 nicely balanced throughout the tissues. Uh, and uh, its availability, T3's availability is also ensured by this reservoir of T4. Okay? It's, it then is basically uh, conjugated and excreted out. Uh, another point about RT3 is uh, say, for example, in hyperthyroid uh, states, you would expect the RT3 to raise. So hyperthyroid uh, states, uh, RT3 is raised, which shows that thyroid is into overactivity. Okay, so this is just on a side note, some additional uh, reconciliatory knowledge so that uh, basic physiology is also covered along uh, these uh, clinical uh, scenarios. Okay, so now TikTok, you need to think, pause, and think about these questions. Uh, think about how uniform distribution of that radioactive iodine has excluded, for sure, excluded one of the diagnoses so that we can pinpoint our final diagnosis. Okay, so hopefully you have uh, given it a good thought. Um, and this was Uruj's basically. Uh, result on the gamma probe. You can see that uh, not only is the thyroid, uh, this is as compared to the normal, you can see that it's not only enlarged in size, but also the, the radioactive iodine is uh, distributed throughout the two lobes of the gland as compared to normal. And it's very clear these lobes are small, the uptake is all right. Here you see that whatever this was at normal state here, it's very busy, it looks angry, uh, and it has picked up a lot of iod uh, that I I radioactive iodine uh, because it's in hyper state. It, it is really busy and it has enlarged itself as well, which explains, which is which we saw at the examination where Ruj had a, uh, had a big swelling uh, in, his, in her neck. So it, it, it suggests that all of the, all of the uh, gland has gone into hyperactivity, which rules out fictitious hyperthyroidism. Why does it do that? If Rouge were taking exogenous thyroid uh, hormones, the thyroid gland by negative feed, feedback would have been inhibited. Hence in that state, it wouldn't have taken up lots of uh, radioactive iodine uh, because it doesn't need it, it's, it's suppressed. Uh, for what it knows, it already has produced a lot of thyroid hormones and it's now sitting resting because in the blood there is lots of thyroid hormones. However, the source of those thyroid hormones is exogenous. Okay, 
but thyroid gland is not concerned with that. Thyroid hormone is obviously linked with the blood thyroid hormone levels in a negative feedback loop, as you already know. So if this is the case of the radioactive reuptake test, then surely it's Graves' disease. It cannot be exogenous thyroid hormones. So we have ruled that out, and now uh, we know uh, that Rouge has uh, Graves' disease confirmed. Question number four. Hmm. So we see that there is another test. What's going on here? We confirmed that it was Graves' disease. Well, uh, this is like a teaching moment. Okay, it's not necessary uh, to run this particular test called resin uptake test, R3 resin uptake test. Uh, but we would like to explain it to you because in some cases uh, the diagnosis is not this straightforward. All right, so this test needs to be done. That's one. That's one point. One reason. Number two reason is that there is a lot of discussion of thyroid binding globulin, TBG, uh, in this test. Uh, and this, uh, the key part of this uh, question will be a busy discussion, mainly revolving around what happens to the thyroid glands when they hit the blood. Uh, if you remember, they are, in, they are mainly uh, attached, most of the uh, thyroxin T4, which is released by the thyroid gland is attached with plasma proteins. Which plasma proteins? We will discuss this in the key portion, okay? So once again, there are two reasons for teaching this particular test. One is to further clarify and confirm the diagnosis of hyperthyroidism uh, and specifically uh, what type of uh, hyperthyroidism is there. Uh, and number two, it will also clarify to you uh, the role of TBG uh, uh, and sometimes even when the thyroid is fine, uh, it's not uh, at the center of the problem. It's the TBGs, the, the, the globulins that bind to thyroid hormones. Their fluctuation causes all sorts of um, clinical manifestations of hyper or hypothyroidism. If you're surprised, wait for the discussion in the key section of question four. All right, let me just read out uh, these three lines here. So this is the name of the test, the T3 resin uptake test, okay? Uh, Rouge's T3 uptake was increased uh, using all this information you have been giving so far. Explain this finding. What is, how do we explain this finding? Okay, so small bits first. What's a resin? Okay, resin basically is a, it's a chemical, I, I won't go into chemistry. This is not uh, the, the forum for that. But what is a resin? Resin is, 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 a, is a chemical or a formulation, chemical formulation, which is designed to uh, uh, capture or bind with something, okay? Now it has a lot of uh, commercial use uh, in, in chemistry and in manufacturing this, that, the other. But right now, our obvious focus is uh, how does it help us in our diagnosis, okay? So this resin, this chemical formulation is designed uh, such that it can bind with the thyroid hormone, okay? That's why it's T3 resin uptake test, okay? Now, if you can imagine, um, <clears throat> I'm sure you read ELISA uh, in the introductory chapter of Guyton, right at the end, he discusses what an ELISA is. ELISA is an essay, not, e, not with an E, with an A, A W -S, S A Y, essay. There is a plate with a lot of wells in it. The wells have uh, enzymes, uh, a, a particular enzyme uh, in those wells. I'm explaining the ELISA very briefly first. So when you uh, drop uh, any, any, any uh, substance on top of these wells, which has a substrate for those enzymes, obviously the enzyme will connect with the substrate and change it. And that change is then read by a, a ELISA reader. Okay, that's that's the that's the ELISA. It's an essay, A W S A Y essay. This resin uptake test is also an essay. So if you can imagine a similar plate with wells in it, and in those wells you have the T3 resin. Okay, now these these wells are designed to uh, to connect 
with uh, the thyroid hormones uh, in the substance that you if the substance which you drop on these wells have the thyroid hormone they will these these wells will the resin in it will connect with that hormone simple as that okay so if that is clear one more addition to this is that when we run this test we have this plate right with the wells that i just described we also add the patient's uh, serum in it so in this in this case uruj's uh, blood will be taken will be drawn serum will be separated and then that serum a known amount of it will be added to the resin plate okay now now we are ready for the actual test now we will take now we will take uh, a radioactive uh, known quantity of radioactive t3 okay so these are these uh, formulations are available radioactive t3 is available we will take a known amount of radioactive t3 and we will put it on top of this uh, setup on top of this resin which has those wells which are ready uh, as i explained and which also has the patient's sample okay okay so let's extend that ex imagination <clears throat> um when in this whole setting on this stage where you have the resin on a plate and then you have uruj's serum which contains uh, thyroid hormones both in the bound form and the free form right it's the bound form that you need to concentrate on so this serum has thyroid binding globulin tbg and obviously that tbg will be uh, uh, saturated with both t4 and t3 right now on this you have now poured a known quantity of radioactive t3 what do you think will happen think what will happen is that radioactive t3 because it's basically t3 but it's tagged it's like it's illuminated by the radioactive uh, bit right it will first try and find a place on the tbg okay if it finds its place a, a free site to bind it will first bind on that tbg right what about the rest of that radioactive t3 so if it finds certain sites say five sites for example it will first bind to those five sites on the tbg and uh, that's that what about the rest of the uh, radioactive t3 molecules well when they don't have any uh, site left on the tbg they will then take up the resin they will bind to the resin in those wells uh, outside of the tbg okay so what's going on what are we doing it's not a, a pointless uh, experiment it's actually a, it's a, it's an ingenious one imagine that you have hyperthyroid hyperthyroidism okay uh, the thyroid hormones are already a lot in the blood yes now if they are a lot then a lot of tbg will be saturated with t3 t4 and t3 yes okay so in this situation <clears throat> would our radioactive t3 have uh, uh, any any big prospects of getting uh, a vacant site on the TBG? No, it will have less because it's a, a serum from a hyperthyroid patient. So most of that radioactivity you will find bound to the resin in the plate and that's how it will be read. So if you find that your plate is illuminated by the resin being bound to the radioactive T3, you know that this sample is of a patient of hyperthyroidism, bingo. And if the resin takes up less of the radioactive T3, you should automatically assume that most of that radioactive T3 had an opportunity to bind with the TBG, which, was, which must have been vacant, right? So in that case, it's hypo. Thyroids. 
here you go so this is that this is an actual picture probably uh, this is tbg of in a hyperthyroid patient okay as you can see most of it is already bound with t4 uh, the rest of the sites were vacant for our radioactive t3 and that's where it first bound but the rest of the sample in in, in this it, he has taken one two three four five six seven eight nine ten so let's imagine 10 molecules of radioactive t3 so four had a chance to bind with tbg okay only four and the rest had to uh, had to uh, uh, bind with the resin which is outside of the tbg on the plate that we used okay so this base this this whole test uh, is read from the resin bound t3 and since it's more and there are values obviously standardized values that we know that okay if uh, if the radioactive uh, resin connected t3 value is uh, xyz above that then you have hyperthyroidism of this patient and here as i explained in hypo uh, you will have tbg much more available for your incoming t3 uh, and very less will be bound to the resin and hence uh, you will have a confirmed diagnosis of hypo hypothyroidism okay i hope this is clear so TikTok, pause the video and think how this uh, information uh, further educates you about this diagnosis okay so this is the key uh, this finding of increased t3 resin uptake has really two possibilities one uh, is that maybe the TBG levels uh, in a person, when they decrease, then uh, that uh, radioactive T3 does not have enough binding sites uh, on TBG to connect, right? So where will it go? It will obviously go to the resin. And hence, uh, the, the value of resin bound T3 will be increased. Uh, the, other, the only other possibility is if the th thyroid hormones, the levels of thyroid hormones themselves are uh, uh, so increased uh, that the TBG cannot handle it really and hence there will always be a leftover of thyroid hormones and those leftover thyroid hormones are actually the ones who get taken up by the resin. In our case, Ruchi's case, it's the latter because we know that she's suffering from Graves disease where there is increase in uh, the thyroid hormones being produced, the endogenous uh, thyroid hormones by the hyperactive gland and the relative binding sites on the TBG uh, uh, are hardly left uh, any uh, to bind the radioactive T3 hence the spill over to the resin as I just explained and hence the uh, the increased T3 resin uptake uh, result that has come up so uh, the, the interpretation really is that Uruj suffers from uh, a hyperthyroid state in which the endogenous thyroid hormones are increased a lot okay uh, following is a, a bit more detail about uh, thyroid binding proteins in the plasma which i think should be explained at this point to increase the depth of your knowledge regarding uh, thyroid binding proteins and how even in the presence of a normal thyroid gland these can be uh, uh, be naughty with the amount of thyroid uh, hormones available in plasma, okay? More in the next uh, short video. Okay, so at this juncture, I wanted to uh, talk a bit about uh, the thyroid binding proteins themselves. And the reason is, um, well, I'll give you two examples. Uh, you'll see why uh, I felt the need to uh, address this issue uh, sort of separately uh, so let's take two scenarios one is uh, pregnancy and the other is hepatic failure in pregnancy uh, let's say the thyroid is fine uh, in both cases in pregnancy it's fine and so is the case in the liver failure the thyroid gland is fine and it's producing uh, the normal amount of uh, thyroid hormones however in pregnancy you have increased estrogens now estrogen has an effect on the liver to produce more thyroid binding proteins 
So this is an important point to note. While in hepatic failure, since these uh, proteins are made in the liver uh, and the liver has failed or is failing, the protein production by this liver will decrease. Okay. Remember, the thyroid is fine, but in one scenario, say the pregnancy or similar cases where the estrogen has gone up, induces protein uh, formation from the uh, from the liver. So you have artificially more uh, 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 thyroid binding proteins uh, roaming around in your blood as compared to a non-pregnant person. And same is the case with uh, the hepatic failure person. This person has lower amount of thy thyroid binding uh, proteins as compared to a normal person. Now, this is, this is now the issue. In case of pregnancy and all the states where you have uh, artificially or abnormally bumped up the amount of thyroid binding proteins in the blood with a euthyroid status. Euthyroid is, thyroid is fine. So whatever normal amount of hormone that thyroid will make and push it into blood, uh, everything gets bound to the proteins, the thyroid binding proteins, uh, uh, which basically means that the free amount of thyroid hormones will be less by no fault of thyroid gland by virtue of there is just too much uh, uh, ubers which collect this hormone so the bound state as you know is not physiologically active it's the free state that is active so in pregnancy as an example you will have a situation where this a normally released thyroid hormone gets uh, bound with these proteins a lot, decreasing the free amount, i.e. the amount that is required for physiological action. So the person will, in, a, in, a, in the transient state, will become hypothyroid. All right, hypothyroid. However, uh, something says the day later, I will come to that. Let's go to the hepatic failure chap. Okay, this guy is producing lesser amount of thyroid binding proteins. So the thyroid minding its own business, uh, uh, keeps on making normal amount of thyroid hormones, dumps it into blood, but there is not enough Ubers. Okay, there are not any Ubers in the blood. I'm just giving you an example, the carriers of thyroid hormones. So they, they are not, they're not enough proteins, thyroid binding proteins to bind to this uh, this normal amount of uh, thyroid hormones. Uh, so the free amount of uh, thyroid hormones will go up artificially, artificially, because everything is normal from the thyroid point of view. But since the proteins are less, you will have more free thyroid uh, uh, hormones floating around, which will in transient, uh, transiently will, will uh, appear as hyperthyroidism. Okay. But since I mentioned this, these are transient states, what happens is something good happens. In the first example, the, the pregnancy, what happens is uh, too much binding leads to lower amount of uh, free hormone that is available. This gives the message, as I already mentioned, that thyroid hormones, the level of thyroid hormone is in a negative feedback loop with the thyroid uh, uh, gland itself. So if you decrease the amount of free, free, free uh, thyroid hormones, this will uh, give uh, the feedback to the thyroid gland that something wrong is happening. There is not enough thyroid hormone. Although there is, if you measure the total amount of thyroid, T4 as an example, it will come out to be normal, but the free variety because of that protein issue has decreased. So this will give a sort of inappropriate feedback to the thyroid gland to bump up the production of thyroid hormones, which in this case is actually important because the pregnant lady has gone into hypothyroidism. So with this inappropriate message, uh, it's like two errors canceling each other. Okay. So this, 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 uh, this feedback loop will trigger uh, the th thyroid hormone to increase production of thyroid uh, hormones. Those thyroid hormones will come into the blood. The free amount of thyroid will go up. Okay. And th the thing, the thing will be normalized and the pregnant person will be euthyroid and she will be fine. Although the total number of uh, thyroid hormone 
will be a bit more, but eventually this will be regulated to normalcy. Same is the case with the uh, uh, hepatic failure chap. Okay, uh, his uh, uh, artificially bumped up free hormone uh, hormones thyroid hormones that are available in the blood because of deficiency of binding proteins will be read by the thyroid gland as there's too much going on. Let me decrease the amount of production so that when the decrease the production uh, uh, level is decreased less amount of thyroid hormones hit the blood and hence euthyroid status is uh, uh, again achieved um, so as you can see this is the this is this is like another uh, it's another small planet uh, ruled by uh, thyroid uh, uh, binding uh, proteins and uh, uh, reading this along with thyroid physiology is very very important because these are those confusing MCQs and scenarios where uh, you will read the word euthyroid, but the clinical picture will be hyper or hypothyroid. And now you understand where is the trick coming from? It's coming from the thyroid binding uh, proteins. So let's now cover a, a bit of slides, uh, just uh, of, uh, two really. Uh, one is uh, this, yes. So in this slide, you'll see uh, this is an overview slide binding of thyroid hormones to plasma proteins in normal adults so basically he has he he, he is outlined this is from genong this is very nice uh, uh, this and the next slide both are from genong so we have the tbg which i have been mentioning uh, look at the amount of plasma normal amount of plasma concentration of tbg is just two milligram per deciliter keep that in mind then there is uh, this protein called uh, transthyretin which is uh, previously known as thy thyroxin binding pre-albumin or TBPA, but now it's the latest version uh, in, uh, 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 in the, uh, on the clinical front. It's called transthyretin, okay? Its concentration is 15 milligram per deciliter, definitely more than TBG. And then you see the albumin, the big uh, uh, plasma protein, and you see the amount, which is obviously 3,500 milligram per deciliter. So on the, on the le plasma level, you see that TBG is the least and albumin is the most. However, check this out. Amount of circulating hormone, hormone bind in percentage. You see clearly that TBG binds much more uh, 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 T4 and T3 than transthyretin or albumin. Even though albumin is significantly, significantly more. Still, this proves that the binding affinity for thyroid hormones of TBG is the most. And that's why it's almost a synonym to say thyroid binding protein, thyroid binding globulin. It's really the same thing because the rest of them are, uh, are negligible as com compared to the TBG. That's why you will, you have mostly uh, heard TBG when I have mentioned this, okay? This, uh, this slide really encapsulates uh, a lot of stuff uh, uh, which I have mentioned in the two scenarios, but this encapsulates the whole thing. Uh, so what he does is he is talking about variation in uh, thyroid binding proteins. You, you may uh, uh, refer to it as TBG or that's for inclusion purposes, let's say it's proteins. On the various parameters of thyroid function. So hyperthyroidism, we, we've already done this uh, with Uruj's case. Let's just revise it. The concentration of binding proteins, we assume that the rouge does not have a problem with the liver. Okay. Uh, and and uh, uh, she has a normal uh, uh, amount of uh, thyroid binding proteins circulating in her blood. Uh, however, the total plasma T4, T3, or RT3 are bumped up because she has Graves' disease. Uh, the free variety is also high, again, because the endogenous uh, hormones are more. Plasma T TSH is the clue. Uh, if somebody is reading this uh, table for the first time, that it is Graves' disease because it's low. We have already discussed it. The clinical uh, picture that comes out is hyperthyroidism. Hypo is again, let's assume that the concentration of binding proteins is normal. However, the hormones, both bound, uh, total and free, will be low. TSH will obviously be high. The next, by the way, scenario is hypothyroidism. So we will go into details of this. And the clinical state, the clinical picture is of a hypothyroid. Now, these are the two which you need to concentrate on. This, so estrogens, and then uh, you have some uh, medicines 
you have heroin, which obviously is uh, uh, a big issue these days, uh, tranquilizers, etc. These induce uh, more production of thyroid binding proteins. Okay, so remember this: estrogens, pregnancy, the same thing. Okay, so if you have a high concentration of plasma proteins, the total amount, the total amount of uh, thyroid hormones, as I mentioned, will be high. However, it's the free thing, the, the biologically active thy uh, thyroxine which is available, it will be kept normal because of that feedback loop which we have dis just discussed. A plasma TSH will be normal, of course, because the free variety has been kept in check. Okay, and remember, all regulatory mechanisms from the pituitary to the thyroid, they and the tissues, they all respond to biologically available free uh, uh, thyroxine and T3, not the bound one. Okay, so the clinical picture in this case is after settlement, after the transient state is over, it's euthyroid. Initially, in the transient state, it will be, as I mentioned, hypo. It will go into hypothyroid, but eventually, it will even out and it will become euthyroid. Uh, the last point is, uh, as I mentioned, the liver failure chap. Along with that, glucocorticoids, androgens, and medica some certain medications, they decrease the amount of production of thyroid binding uh, proteins and hence decrease the total amount of uh, bound thyroid ho hormones in blood with these, with these TBG, uh, with these TBPs. Okay? However, the normal free variety is again through that negative feedback loop is kept normal. Plasma TSH hence is normal and the clinical state is euthyroid. I, I can totally envisage making some confusing MCQs based on uh, this uh, thyroid hormone binding proteins uh, in the exams. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next question is, uh, the diagnosis gets confirmed. It's Graves' disease indeed. Uh, what is the etiology and pathophysiology of the disease? Etiology is what's the origin? Why does it happen? And pathophysiology is uh, in this disease, whatever the cause is, how does it create the disease? Okay, so let's give you time. Oops, TikTok, pause and think. Right, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, Graves' disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. Uh, the etiology is it's an autoimmune disorder, so it's a, a dysfunction of. The, uh, the immune system in which uh, the immune system uh, erratically targets its own, uh, in this case, the thyroid uh, gland itself. Uh, and what's the uh, pathophysiology? Is that these uh, immunoglobins that it, uh, the immune system creates, which targets the thyroid uh, gland, they actually uh, function like the TSH. So these thyroid stimulating immunoglobins, uh, they stimulate the thyroid gland, just like the TSH does. The difference is there is no TSH which is actually doing it. It's these phony uh, TSH-like agents, the TSIs, which are doing the damage. And obviously, they are not under the purview of the regulation, the negative feedback that normally TSH obeys. Uh, this is just an erratic system where uh, the immune system just keeps on producing these TSIs and hence uh, Graves' disease. Uh, becomes what it is, I, I, a, a, an example of hyperthyroidism. 